Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing each and every one of us here. We know that your spirit has led us here because we know this is a place where we hear your word, where we the other people who love you, and this is where we should be. We pray that the message that you have for us from your word this morning will take root in our hearts, become a real part of our lives, and stick with us. Pray your spirit down upon this message in your name. Amen. Amen. There's a pretty popular inspirational story. You may have heard of this. You may not have. But it goes like this. There was a 10-year-old boy who decided to study judo, despite the fact that he had lost his left arm in a devastating car accident. The boy began lessons with an old Japanese judo master. The boy was doing well, so he couldn't understand why, after three months of training, the master had taught him only one move. Sensei, the boy finally said, shouldn't I be learning more moves? This is the only move you know, but this is the only move you'll ever need to know, the sensei replied. Not quite understanding, but believing in his teacher, the boy kept training. Several months later, the sensei took the boy to his first tournament. Surprising himself, the boy easily won his first two matches. The third match proved to be more difficult, but after some time, his opponent became impatient and charged. The boy definitely used his one move to win the match. Still amazed by his success, the boy was now in the finals. This time, his opponent was bigger, stronger, and more experienced. For a while, the boy appeared to be overmatched. Concerned that the boy might get hurt, the referee called a timeout. He was about to stop the match when the sensei intervened. No, the sensei insisted. Let him continue. Soon after, the match resumed. His opponent, opponent made a critical mistake. He dropped his guard. Instantly, the boy used his move to pin him. The boy had won the match and the tournament. He was the champion. On the way home, the boy and sensei revo- reviewed every move in each and every match. Then the boy summoned the courage to ask what was really on his mind. Sensei, how did I win the tournament with only one move? You won for two reasons, the sensei answered. First, you've almost mastered one of the most difficult throws in all of judo. And second, the only known defense for that move is for your opponent to grab your left arm. You see, the boy's greatest perceived weakness turned out to be his greatest strength. Today we're going to talk about a man named Ehud, who everyone thought had a terrible weakness. He was limited. But God used that weakness to show his strength. God used Ehud's weakness to show his strength to the people of Israel. So as we take a look at the passage here, in Judges chapter 3, we're going to be focusing on verses 15 through 24. But the passage starts a little bit earlier up in verse 12. And the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. What we first see about Ehud, when we read in verse uh, uh, 15, because the children of Israel are once again conquered, and they cry out to the Lord, and he raises up another judge, another deliverer for them, and his name is Ehud. But what do we find out about Ehud? In verse 15, that he is the son of Gera, the Benjamite. Okay. A left-handed man. So the first point what I want to know about this passage here is that Ehud has a weakness. When I put that in quotes, as you'll see here, there are several references in Hebrew to either being being right-handed or being on the right hand of something, meaning to imply that you're righteous, that you have strength, that you're skilled at something. And there are other references in Hebrew to being left-handed or being on the left hand of something, implying that you're not righteous, that you're clumsy, that you're awkward, that you're not skilled, that you have a weakness. In fact, left-handed, the word here used in verse 15, left-handed in Hebrew, literally means impeded in the right hand, bound in the right hand, you can't use it. And so he was only left-handed. And in this culture, like I said, the Hebrew was that right hand equals good, left hand equals weakness. And so why it's mentioned here is that you'll see why why it's important later on. But why it's also mentioned is to show us how Ehud was perceived by everyone else around him. 
Everyone else around him saw him as having weakness, that he was weak, that he really had no purpose in life. And we see later on that he does have a purpose and what that purpose is. Nevertheless, being left-handed did give you an upper hand in battle. We see a reference in, later on in Judges chapter 20, 16, about 700 left-handed Benjamites that could, I'm going to try this with my left hand, could slay a stone and hit the target every time within a hair's breadth, the verse says. They were extremely well aimed, and they were 700 seemingly weak people, right? They were left-handed. So even though it was seen in the culture as being left-handed was a weakness, you could hone that skill and be a force to be reckoned with during battle. But nevertheless, in that culture, in that time period, if you were left-handed, you were seen as weak. You were seen as somebody less than someone who was right-handed. There was a weakness. Nevertheless, God raises up Ehud. That doesn't stop God, right? God raises up Ehud for his divine plan and uses Ehud's strengthness, or weakness as his strength. And this was the plan. We read in verses starting in uh, verse 16. Ehud made himself a dagger. It was double-edged and a cubit in length and fastened it under his clothes on his right thigh. That was the plan. Back in that day, the sickle sword, anyone know what I'm talking about? A sickle sword, half moon sort of, sort of shaped sword was the popular sword during that time period. It's used to hack off limbs and heads and stuff like that, right? That was why it was popular. The least popular sword was the double-edged sword. And not only that, but the guards, Eglon's guards, would not have looked for any sword on the right thigh. Because like I said, if you were perceived as left-handed, you were perceived as weak. You were, there was no threat with you. Because if you, usually, if you're right-handed, you have a sword on your left thigh, right? Because you can pull it out and be ready to uh, block any, any move from the opponent. If you had it on your right side, it'd be kind of hard to, first of all, get it out. It's kind of awkward. But then you leave your whole front as a target for the person that you're fighting against. So obviously that's why you see people go like this. When, when you see the movies, people the sword. They pull across, so they would have been looking for a weapon on Ehud's left thigh. Not on Ehud's right thigh. And this was the plan. Who knows what was going on in the palace, in Egon's palace at this time. It may have been that this was tribute day. Everyone was bringing their tribute to Egon. And so the guards just thought, okay, just look uh, at, the, at the left thigh. And if there's nothing there, then that person's good to go. Because... He's left-handed. If, he, if he's not right-handed, he's left-handed. And he's weak, so he's not threat anyways. So, he, so this was the plan. He made himself a sword. That's what we read in, in verse 16. Ehud made himself a dagger. It's about a cubit in length, which is about 18 inches. And he fastened it on his... Sorry, right thigh. All right? And it says that there was... It went, when he did stab it into Eglon, it went all the way up to the hilt. So there was no cross hilt on it. And the hilt was, so it was, a, it was, a, it was an 18-inch long uh, dagger, no cross hilt, just some wrapping around the handle to grip it. And so uh, when you would thrust it into somebody, I'm, I'm sorry, the Bible doesn't show the code, so I'm not going to show you the code. When you thrust it into somebody, the handle acts as a cork for the wound. There's very little blood in this attack. And we read later on that Egon, because he's so fat, the fat just kind of closes up over it. Okay, so this was the plan. Ehud was going to attach an 18-inch dagger on his right thigh. No one would be looking for it. And it would be made for uh, punching into somebody, and the handle would be used as a cork. This, is, this was the plan, all right? Um, so Ehud chose a sword specifically designed for this, to quickly kill somebody. This was the plan. Maybe you or someone you know is one who is seen by the society around you as having weakness, as being disabled in some way, as, having, as not quite measuring up to the societal standard of how a person should be and act. Maybe that's you. Maybe that's someone you know. That everyone else around you sees that you have a weakness. Those are all lies. 
Because God does not make mistakes. Amen. God created each and every one of us. And what the world around us sees as a handicap or as a limit, as a weakness, God uses for strength. Have you ever ever thought about that? What that purpose of that limit, seemingly limitless or weakness could be? Have you ever asked God, instead of ask God, God, why me? Why do I have this? Why do I have this issue? Why do I have this limitation, this weakness? You ever turn that on its head and ask God, why did you give this to me? How can I use this for you? What is the purpose of this? How can you use this for your glory and for your strength? Just as evil, the very thing you or others see as a weakness or a limitation in yourself can be the very thing God uses to show his strength to bring others to Him, to inspire people to follow Him, to build His kingdom brick by brick, weakness by weakness. The bricks God uses to build His kingdom to show His strength. When Christ redeems you, He redeems all of you. Not just your spiritual part of yourself. He redeems all of you. And He takes everything that is you, weakness, limitation, and all, and He redeems them. He uses those for his own purposes. He transforms them. For our seeming weakness should be celebrated as God's way to do great things. Because when we are at our weakest, that is when God is at his strongest. 1 Corinthians 1, 27-30. This is our call to worship this morning. But God shows what the world considers foolish to shame the wise. God shows what the world considers weak to shame the strong. And God chose what the world considers low class and low life, what is considered to be nothing, to reduce what is considered to be something to nothing. So no human being can brag in God's presence. It is because of God that you are in Christ Jesus. He became wisdom from God for us. This means that He made us righteous and holy, and He delivered us. Not our own strength, God's strength. The Apostle Paul again talks about his weakness in 2 Corinthians 12, 8-10. I pleaded with the Lord three times, I pleaded three times for it to leave me alone, this weakness, whatever it is. And God said to me, my grace is enough for you because power is made perfect in weakness. Let's sink in a little bit. Power is made perfect in weakness. So I'll gladly spend my time bragging about my weaknesses so that Christ's power can rest on me. Never think about that, bragging about our weaknesses. But that's exactly what Paul wants to get across. So then God's strength, God's God's power is what shines through. Therefore, I'm all right with my weaknesses, with insults, with disasters, with harassments, and stressful situations for the sake of Christ, because when I am weak, then I'm strong. Amen. Ehud had a weakness. God's strength was the power that delivered Israel. Because Ehud could not do it on his own. Right? It was only through God's power. And God wanted to use Ehud, whom everyone else saw as being inferior to be the one to deliver Israel through his power. So that's what we see here in the first part of this passage here. The Ehud has a weakness, but in the end, it's it's, it's there to to illustrate God's strength. The second thing that we notice here about this passage is God's plan. We have Ehud's weakness, and then we have God's plan. Because think about it. Ehud just didn't come out of nowhere to fulfill this plan. Right? God had already placed him in a position, in a job. This was his job, to bring tribute from Israel to Edom. Now, how do we get to this point? When we read here, we start in verse 12. And the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. So this is after Othniel dies, the God we talked about last week. And once again, the children of Israel go right back to their evil ways. Again, do evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord strengthened Eglon, king of Moab, against Israel, 
because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. Verse 13. Then he gathered to himself the people of Ammon and Amalek, went and defeated Israel, and took possession of the city of Palms. So the children of Israel served Eglon, king of Moab, 18 years. And that's what brings us up to the passage that we're focusing on today. So the Moabite people, along with the Ammonites and the Amalekites, they are nomadic tribes. They don't have their own land. Israel has land. This is after the book of Joshua. This is after all the cities and land that Joshua has conquered in the name of God. And so Israel has land at this point. But the Moabites, Eglon, king of the Moabite people, and the Ammonites and the Amalekites come as nomadic tribes and take over what we read here, the city of Palms. In other words, Palm City. It seems like it's a city that should be in California or something. Right? <laughs> the nickname for Palm City is Jericho. Does that name sound familiar at all to anybody? Yeah. All right, so Joshua conquers Jericho. We know about that story. Walking around the walls, the walls fall down. And later on, we read um, in Joshua 18.21 that God then, then gives Jericho, that Joshua conquers, to the Benjamites, the tribe of Benjamin, whom our guy here, Ehud, is from. So Jer this, is, this is personal for you. When Eglon takes over Jericho, he's taking over one of his family's legacy cities, one of, part of his heritage. So this is personal for you. Why, why did Eglon focus on Palm City, on Jericho? Well, exactly how the name describes. This is a, an oasis in the middle of the wilderness, the surrounding wilderness. So if you control Palm City, if you control Jericho, you control all the surrounding land. Because all the trading routes went through there, and then it's an oasis, so that's where all the resources came from. So if you control that, you control all the surrounding area. So that's why Elon focused on Palm City. So Elon is sitting up in Palm City in Jericho, and God places Ehud to be the one to bring tribute from Israel to Elon. So, Ehud is sent by God. This isn't just a job. This isn't just a job for Ehud. And this is, this is a, a lesson for each and every one of us. Because whatever job we're in, no matter if we think it's meaningless or purposeless, it does have a purpose. We may not see it. Just as Ehud may not have seen his job of bringing tribute to this enemy king as, being, as having some purpose. But behind it all, who was working behind the scenes? Ehud didn't see it. God was using that job that Ehud had to give him glory. So that's a lesson for each and every one of us. No matter what job we have, no matter if we think it's meaningless or purposeless, it always has a purpose for God. We work at it with all our heart to bring glory to God. God has placed us in each and every one of our jobs, our positions, for a purpose. And that's to work at it with all our heart to bring glory to Him. No matter how meaningless it seems to us, it is meaningful to God. That's where He has us. So Ehud is sent by God to reclaim that which God had given to His family, like I mentioned before, and protect their, la their legacy from the end. Ehud is sent by God to reclaim that which God had already given to His family and protect His family's heritage from the end. How far are we willing to go to protect our families from our spiritual enemy. Do we know who our kids are hanging out with? Do we know? Honestly, ask ourselves that. Do we know who our kids are hanging out with? Do we know what movies, TV shows, and music they're entertaining themselves with? Do we know? Do we know what our kids are looking at on the internet? Do we know? Do you know? Honestly ask yourself, do I know? How willing, how, how far are we willing to go to protect our families from our spiritual? Protect our families from our spiritual. So, we have Ehud's weakness that we read about. We have God's plan that he placed Ehud in this position. He used Ehud, his left handedness, his weakness, to fulfill this plan. And we see that that plan leads up to God's deliverance. That we see that Ehud's weakness and God's plan 
leads to God's deliverance. Not Ehud's deliverance. God's deliverance. After Ehud presents the tribute to Eglon, he tells him that he has a secret message for him. That's what we read in verse 19. So he presents the tribute to King Eglon. Verse 19, but he himself turned back from the stone images that were in Gilgal and said, I have a secret message for you, O king. Eglon said, keep silence, and all who attended him went out from him. Verse 20, and Ehud came to him. Now he was sitting upstairs in his cool private chamber. Then Ehud said, I have a message from God for you. So he arose from his seat. Okay, so let's, let's take a look at what go, is going through Eglon's mind. After Ehud presents the tribute to Eglon, he tells him that it is a secret message for him. That's what we read about in verse 20. We read that Eglon is intrigued. Because why else would he invite the enemy, who supposedly who's supposed to come bring him tribute, up to his private chamber, his bedroom, without anyone around, without any guards, anyone to protect him. So he's intrigued by this because what do we read here in verse 19? That Ehud is facing right, the stone images at Gilgal. There was a supernatural connection with this, especially in Eglon's mind. So if he sees Ehud looking at the stone images, we don't know what these were. These could have just been simple stone structures. They could have been idols. But in, e in Eglon's mind, this is what's important. There's a supernatural, conne supernatural connection to this. So when Ehud is looking at them, and then turns around and says, I have a secret message for you. Instantly, the connection is made in Eglon's mind. Okay, so there's something that, a supernatural message from the world beyond, from a God that he wants to tell me. So that's why he's intrigued. His pride gets the better of him. Oh, I'm the king. There must be some message for me about what's going to happen in the future, what I should be expecting. So he invites Ehud up to his private chamber where no one can protect him because he's the only one who wants to hear this message. He doesn't want anyone else around him to hear this message. So then when Ehud reiterates in uh, verse 20, I have a message from God for you. This is no surprise in Ehud's mind. Oh, I knew that was coming. You can basically hear him saying his own mind, right? But what's interesting here is that Ehud says, I have a message from God for you. Now, the other times in the Old Testament when we know that the Hebrew word Yahweh is used, how is it written for us in English? Lord, all in caps, right? That's how we know that the, the personal name for Yahweh, the one true God, is being used there. But Ehud says the word God. Or in Hebrew, uh, Elohim or Elohim. Does this look familiar to anybody? Right. It means the mighty one, the one above all the other gods. And so there may have been a connection in Eglon's mind. Okay, Ehud is an Israelite. He worships Yahweh. So he must mean he has a message from Yahweh to me. But Ehud doesn't explicitly say that. So Eglon could have made the connection, or he could have just, in his mind, thought, okay, this is the mighty one, the one above all other gods. So, I'd be best to hear what this guy has to say to me. So he invites Ehud up to his private chambers, his bedroom. And Ehud seizes that opportunity. Because when he says, I have a message from God for you, Ehud does what? What is his initial reaction? He, sits, he stands up out of his chair that he was sitting in, making himself, what? A perfect target for anything, anything Ehud's going to do to him. So he stands up, makes himself a perfect target. Remember, God's plan, God's deliverance. This is all being orchestrated by God. Ehud seizes the opportunity, grabs his dagger, and thrusts it into Eglon so that, what do we read? We read here in um, verse 22. He thrusts it into Eglon. The fat closes up over the blade. There's very little blood, but what happens? His entrails come out. Now again, the Bible doesn't sugarcoat this, so I'm not going to sugarcoat it. What's another word for entrails? Intestines. intestines. We got it. All right. What is produced in the intestines? Bodily waste, right? 
So when these come pouring out of Eagle, what do you think the surrounding room smells like around them? Bodily waste. Bodily <laughs> waste. You got it. Exactly. All right? So what we read in verse 24, that Ehud does this, escapes through the porch, locks the door behind him to give him enough time to escape. Verse 24, when he, Ehud, had gone out, Eglon's servants came to look, and to their surprise, the doors of the upper room were locked. So their initial reaction, doors are locked. It smells like bodily waste. Put one and one together. Okay. He must be relieving himself. So no worry. Everything's cool. So they wait, giving Ehud plenty of time to escape from the palace, to go up to the mountains. And we know what the end of the story is. If we keep reading, he goes, he escapes up into the mountains, calls the children of Israel together, says, come down and attack the Moabites, for God has, for God has delivered them into your hands. They do that. They attack a people who just discover, because it, they do, event, the servants do eventually go in and investigate. Okay, what, what's going on? Maybe, he, maybe we need to check on him. Maybe he's not doing so well. So they go in, they finally get into the room, they see that he's dead. So they do discover that their king is dead. So Ehud with the Israelites come attack a people who just realize that the king is dead, easily defeat them, and God delivers his people. After 18 years of, captive, of being conquered, God delivers his people. And what we notice here in Scripture is that it didn't take 18 years for God to hear what they were saying to him. But what do we read? Verse 15, And when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. It wasn't that it took God 18 years to hear what Israel was saying to them. It's that it took Israel 18 years to realize what they were doing. To figure out, okay, we must be conquered because God's not pleased with us because we're doing evil in His sight. But nevertheless, the important part being that God is faithful. God had a plan to deliver them all along. And when they finally cried out to Him, He executed this plan. He takes a person of perceived weakness to show forth His strength. Put them in a position that would be easy to uh, carry out this plan. And through this plan that God initiates, that God orchestrates, God delivers His people. Amen. This inspires us. This inspires us because God is orchestrating all of our lives. All right? When God tells us He wants to do something, He sees to it that it's accomplished. Imagine, the author of time and events, who orchestrates everything, has a plan for each and every one of us to build his kingdom. And as we become a part of that plan, everything he wants us to do, everything he calls us to do, is accomplished. So everything that we think is a weakness in us, God uses for his strength to build his kingdom. Brick by brick, like I said before, weakness by weakness. God can and is using each member of our family right here, right now, today to build His kingdom. Think about it. Think about what weaknesses has God given to me? What weaknesses has He given to me? And be creative about it. How can I use those weaknesses? How can God's strength be shown through those weaknesses for His glory? How can, how can I address that weakness? How can I use that weakness for God's glory, for His strength to work through that weakness? How can God right here, right now, use our weaknesses for His glory? To use our weaknesses, that, that which the world all around us sees as nothing, to use for God's glory, to build His kingdom. Let's look to what His plan is, not our own plan, Let's look to see what His plan is for us. Not only as individuals, but as a church, as a family, as one body. How can God use our weaknesses? Because like I said, Christ redeems every part of us. How can God use all of our weaknesses for His glory? So we can boast in nothing of ourselves and all of God and His power and His strength. And when we live
live our lives in being a part of that plan. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for this inspiring story of this man who everyone else thought was weak, who everyone else thought had a limitation. But you precisely used him for your glory, to deliver your people, to show to Israel that even when they were weakest, you are strongest. And to show us even today that same lesson. We pray that this message takes root in our hearts, that we don't walk out from this place and have it spill out the other side of our head, but it becomes a real part of our lives, it becomes a real part of our hearts. And then, above all, we use this lesson, we look at our own lives, we look at our own weaknesses for your glory. We pray all these things in your powerful name.